Here we go. Right. And um, okay, that's interesting. Here's some interesting. <laughs> What's that photo over there? That's all the governors who came from uh, the Southeast Asia, South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, who were here for the CSN governors when I was the governor, so we hosted them. <laughs> so do you think that Mr. Rajapaksa is going to take it back? Yeah. Oh, you're a Christian. Okay. Interesting. Do you think he's going to take it back? Why? Why do you think he's going to take it back? on the wall. The writing's on the wall. Do you think that the writing's on the wall, or do you think that it was just like a warning to the government, this government? If you go around and see, like I have seen, mm -hmm. the mood of the people and um, how much they a dislike this government mm. and b like mr rani mm. that will tell you the story why so, do you think he lost though he lost at that time mm. but that doesn't stay forever the same way he lost three years ago that's perfectly natural for a politician but many of them do come back and he has made a phenomenal comeback he set up his own party, new party. Within one, one year, he beats all the others, leaves them standing. So I think that's a pretty strong message. Yeah. There's no question. I mean, and with that, the trend is clear. Uh, whatever these guys do, I, I don't think they can get their act together to uh, take it forward. And every day we see new... Uh, new uh, developments that are not favorable to the government mm. so i think uh, come a proper election and they have been postponing elections as much as possible so there is a provincial council election that is due right now mm -hmm. which uh, they should have held but they haven't and, uh, if they do hold that it will be very very clear <laughs> to yeah. where the mood of the people is that's interesting well i mean do you think that so, what's your relationship now with the Rajapaksas? Are you still quite close with them? Yeah, I'm close to them. I've been um, advising them on main matters, particularly in relation to the economy and so on. And uh, I have been uh, uh, also doing my own analysis of the economy at regular intervals and making, my, uh, making a few comments on and off. So, that has kept me in touch with the current political field as situation as well as the current uh, economic situation. Sure, that's interesting. So, who will, who will, because Mahindra, uh, Mahindra, Mahindra cannot run again, so who do you think is going to run? Mahindra cannot run as the president, mm. but uh, everything else he can do. And he has the ability today to command the people's wishes very effectively. If you take one example, there was one particular electorate during the last local government elections where the Sri Lanka Pudujana Perimana, that was his proxy party, did not, uh, was disqualified because their nomination papers were faulty and they couldn't contest. So he just came for one meeting and he said, look, we are disqualified, but I think you should vote for this particular party, which was a totally independent party. Nobody knew who they were. And he said, uh, I would like you to support that party mm -hmm. uh, as against the traditional UNP and the SLFP, the President's Party and the Prime Minister's Party. Guess who won? <laughs> you know, that shows that the people were willing to take his word and vote for a completely unknown quantity and put them into, into uh, local government office in that particular area, just on his word. So that also tells me, even though he may not be the president, as, as the constitution now uh, is structured, he will be the main power base. Something like uh, what you have in so many different countries where you have the power with a particular person, and then it, that is where the, it emanates from. So I think uh, Putin, for instance. Right? Putin, for instance. Yeah. So he's like has supposedly the less powerful role, but he really is the. He's the uh, 
med, med, med Medvedev Mentor, is yeah. the one that's supposed to be the one that is supposed to have the power, but really it's with Putin. Absolutely, yeah. like when Lee Kuan Yew was there, mm -hmm. even though Singapore had prime ministers, it was still his uh, authority that ran through. Mm -hmm. And today we saw the other thing. Uh, Mahathir at 92 comes back. No, I thank you so much. Uh, just a little bit, yeah, thank you. Uh, no, you know, I've been you, on you the didn't, you, 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 you didn't follow the story? No, no. He comes in and beats the Umno party, which has been in power for 60 years, comes back, and people vote him. 92 years. <laughs> Can you imagine? So you're saying a fish would have a better chance than this government? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> a dog on the street, maybe. Okay, that's interesting. So, so... I won't, I won't just write them off completely. No. They will try, I mean, come election, they will try very hard. But the people's feelings are so strong. Uh, you'll probably find that uh, that will, uh, they'll, they'll get wiped out. That's my feeling. So who will lead the, so did the brothers figure out who will lead the party then? Having known the family, I think they will work that out uh -huh. if they wish to. I mean, but yet it will be Mahindra Rajapaksa's call. Uh -huh. uh, if he says uh, it's one of the brothers, well, they will, that person will have a very strong uh, mm -hmm. claim. But you never know, he can even say somebody else. Mm. So it all depends on what he says, what he uh, is going to, who, whom he's going to endorse. And that will go a very, very long way. Sure, of course. Hmm. Because we're saying that uh, maybe it's Kotabaya, maybe it's Basel, but it's up in the air. Up in the air. I thought it was going to be decided this week. I thought there was going to be a decision now. No. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are smart political family. What do you think it Yeah, seriously. Yeah. I can't, one of my friends who used to be the ambassador here in 2008, plus, minus, I'm not sure, but he, uh, he said that uh, uh, Sri Lankans are the smartest politicians and he's served in a lot of different countries and I really respect him a lot as an ambassador. I'm mm -hmm. very, I hadn't yet been to Sri Lanka, so I didn't know what to expect. But okay. I called him and I said, going to Sri Lanka, what should I know? And he said, Sri Lankans are the smartest politicians I've ever met. And he which he I said that? I was oh, surprised okay. because, you know, I had worked in Afghanistan alongside him. Mm -hmm. I, you know, seen him in many different roles. And I didn't know anything about Sri Lanka. Other than, that, is that Robert Blake? No, not American. But, oh, okay, okay, okay. But, okay. Um, but uh, you know. He was my friend too, that's why I asked. Oh, Robert Blake, I don't, actually, I haven't met him. So that's interesting. When do you think that they will announce? They won't announce till the elections are announced. But the general elections or the presidential? At the general election, there is no need for a presidential candidate to be announced. Everybody knows who the prime minister would be. So um, it would be for the general elections. Uh, it's not a. It's not going to be an issue. But if there is a presidential election announced by the president uh, before his term. Let's say tomorrow, but he cannot tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> he can do so from about uh, October onwards. Mm -hmm. So in time after October, if he does that, then there will be a necessity to name someone. But otherwise, it will be, a it will probably be a general election, mm -hmm. at which time the party will probably field their candidates. But everybody will know that it's Mahindra Rajapaksa who is going to be the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the law allows him to do that, right? Sorry? The law yeah, allows absolutely. him to do that. Okay. Um, uh, okay, that's interesting. So when you look at this government, and you look at the government that you served in, and you served from, to the end of 2015, right? 2000 and, end of 2015, right up to January 8th, 2015. I, I served from 2005 end really. 2005. So nearly 10 years. As central bank governor. Central bank governor from 1st of June 2006. Till then I was secretary to the Ministry of Plan Implementation. Before that, for about six or eight months. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's interesting. 
So when you look at this government and you look at the government that you've served, if you had to say, this is what we did and this is what they did, can you talk a little bit about what you left behind? I mean, not just you, but your government versus what this government has done Actually, economically. Yeah, economically, we inherited a uh, uh, country which, which was... Uh, which was having a per capita income of $1,240, pretty much in the low level. But we finished off in just a period of nine years at 3850 So that's nearly triple the per capita. Mm -hmm. The GDP went up from $24 billion to $79 billion. So that's again the three times. We left behind a huge infrastructure development which we did not have before 24-hour electricity with the uh, new power plants road network which was completely overhauled with expressways now the expressway that will have probably come in was built during that period southern expressway and so many other plans that were developed for that then of course in addition to that um, after the end of the war. We fought the war also at that time. We had to spend a lot of resources at that time. We brought down the debt to GDP ratio from 91% to 71%. Although the current Prime Minister is eternally shouting that he has got a debt burden, we left him uh, just a 71% when although we inherited 91% debt to GDP uh, burden. With that, we also made sure that the North and the East was developed. If you go to the North today, you'll have new roads, you have new uh, developments, all that. The restructuring, the, the reconstruction effort was a huge uh, effort. It was completed. Then, of course, um, with that, we also developed the human capital. There were new IT industries, the telephone penetration, the IT penetration, all that was enhanced quite uh, significantly. Stock market went up by about four, uh, sorry, sixfold. The the overall market capitalization rose tremendous. I forget the numbers, but quite a significant number. You can check that out. So, in almost every aspect, we brought in a balanced development, Maria. That was our theme. We did not want to only focus on one or two areas. We were fairly keen that all areas progress together. Poverty came down from 12% to 6%. Mm -hmm. Electricity was one of the biggest achievements we had. When we started off, we had only 73% of the people having electricity. We finished up with 99%. So that almost everyone in the country had electricity. So those were huge social uh, uh, improvements which were carried out. As against that, when you see the last three years, hardly any infrastructure uh, projects have been added to the, to the national assets, uh, as it were. We find that the debt to GDP is going up to nearly 80% now. We see inflation going up. We see inflation was at 3%. Today it is at 6%. Mm -hmm. uh, inflation going up. Then we have uh, uh, the famous uh, bond scam, which has uh, given a tremendously bad name to the country. We had $3.4 billion of uh, investments in our treasury bills and treasury bonds, particularly from the US. Mm -hmm. Today it has come down to $1.7 billion. So there has been an exodus of uh, investments. They had to replace it with uh, sovereign bonds, where there the risk is not taken by any foreign investor but by the country because those are dollar bonds and we find that the dollar bonds are yielding something like 6.75 percent interest so we are paying some high fancy prices for that as well so going forward um, i can see a deterioration in almost all the macro numbers and that's frightening and we hardly see anybody in charge. That's the other sad part. If you talk to the IMF, uh, I don't know whether they'll tell you, but they'll 
they tell others in confidence, we see some of them talking about it at various times, uh, that uh, they have nobody to go to and talk to something. Because so many people are supposed to be in charge, president is going one way, prime minister is going another way. So it's, it's a tough call for even the officials. I pity them sometimes because they don't have a clear picture about uh, what's to be done. So all in all, the network is not conducive for the development. If you take the, if you take the FDI, mm -hmm. last year they proclaimed that the FDI was high and that was the highest ever. But every single one of those FDI was a part of the investment that flowed in from projects that were started before 2015. Mm -hmm. Port City, Shangri-La, ITC, all those are projects started before and hardly any projects which have started after 2015. So, and that's not happening even today. Today, even today, there's no new projects coming in. Although they said, you know, we'll have all the projects coming from the US, we'll have projects coming from Europe. No one is interested. And I mean, they actually kind of upset the Chinese, right, when they first came to power. They upset the Chinese mm -hmm. and they had to go back to them on bended knees thereafter because they couldn't find anybody else. And that was, I was um, at that time aghast that they stopped such a project which we had a good handle on and then they, because they stopped it, they had, they lost their momentum, A, the country's momentum was lost and B, because they had erred in stopping that, they had to give in to the Chinese a lot more than they would have wanted to. Mm -hmm. Perhaps even annoying India as a result. <laughs> you know? Well, how do you see that they had to give in to the Chinese even more? Because the Chinese contracts were designed to have ownership with the Sri Lankans. But China could manage the Hambantha to port to some extent, but not have any ownership at all. Hold on, I want to make sure this is recording because somebody called me halfway through. I want to make sure that this is... What our guys do is they put it to the aircraft mode. Mm, that's a good idea. You're teaching me after you had... Yeah, it's recording. Yes, it's recording, sorry. Okay, so, um, sorry, sorry, you were saying that the, the Hamantoto was designed that Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka had the ownership. control uh -huh. and China would have been a contractor and China, together with China, there would have been so many other contractors as well. Someone doing a refinery, someone else doing a, a ship making or whatever. But it was all under the control of the Sri Lanka. But today, they had to part with that control. Today, they had to part with the uh, 148 million dollars which they had to settle as damages to the port city, which was the damages for the delay. And because they couldn't pay it off with cash, they had to give uh, an additional five acres of land to the Chinese. So, they've taken some... Uh, Decisions like that, which uh, actually you you wonder who on earth could have um, advised them in doing that. So we have come out weaker. We have come out, um, and during that period, because the because the country's economy came down, they had to have the Chinese anyway. So they had to go back to them and say, "Please come back." Yeah, and because nobody stepped in, right? They had said. China is the evil and we're going to repair relations with India and with the US and with Europe and then nobody came. Nobody came. And nobody could come actually every time. My own view is I'm giving you maybe something which uh, is different from what you generally hear. At different times of history, there are different countries which have the cash. You've got to understand that. At the moment it is China. So they are the ones who are investing all over. They are investing in the US bonds of 1.6 trillion. So if they do that, they must be having a lot of cash to invest all over the world. So 
they invest in Sri Lanka, they invest in Pakistan, they invest in Bangladesh, they invest in UK, they invest all over. So if they were the guys who are investing, we don't have to get angry with them and shout and scream. We got to say, okay, come and invest. Mm -hmm. And they also, actually I must say, they never demanded anything unusual from us. They gave us loans, we negotiated the loans, and they, they also were happy to come and uh, do those projects for which we committed ourselves with a loan and we were paying back all those loans. So there was, they did not at any time ask us for ownership, I must say. But today, I think the Sri Lankan government has rushed to provide them with ownership. Yeah. Why do you think that? That is because they have messed up the economy and they found that they cannot manage. And they were like this famous uh, comments where you comment to make, the, make it like a prophecy. Our Prime Minister was shouting to everyone mm -hmm. that he cannot pay the debts. So if you cannot, if you shout to someone saying that you cannot pay the debts, naturally your your creditors are going to take advantage of that, and they did. Sure. So I think we we have only ourselves to blame, and we have got ourselves into these positions where we have uh, given total control. One of the most strategic assets in the Indian Ocean is the Hambantot port. Gee. One of the most strategic assets, not only from the point of view of Sri Lanka, but from the point of view of the world. So. That uh, has been bartered away for some pittance. Mm -hmm. um, so, so to play devil's advocate, this government will say Hamantota Total Port didn't make any sense. It was not a port that needed to be built we were left with a black hole that was burning money. It had no business. The government, previous government of Mr. Rajapaksa, I mean, there had to be a presidential decree saying no more uh, 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 delivery of vehicles to Colombo. It all now needs to be diverted to Hamantota. That presidential decree was in 2012. Um, I mean, that shows how this port wasn't even working under the old government. And that old government left us with a financial burden that we then had to figure out what to do with. The only thing we could do, given our finances, was to get rid of it. What do you think about that? I think that's um, not a position that they can hold on to. For the last 30 years, or 40 years, Sri Lanka has been talking of building a port in Hambantota. This didn't start with Mahindraj Pax. This was on the cards for the last 30 to 40 years. But no one could do it. No one had the ability to make it happen. Mahindra Rajapaksa did that. And as you know, every port takes a long time. Sri Lanka's Colombo port is 800 years old. But only during the British that it really started uh, being built on a sort of a professional bay. Mm -hmm. And only a few years ago that it reached a 75% capacity. And then it reached 90% capacity just about a couple of years ago. So you can see these are long-term, 100-year assets that you build. Mm -hmm. You don't build a port for, for it to give you a return in two years. Mm -hmm. It will take time for ships to get to know about Hambantata. You have to develop your skills. You have to see that there are, there's marketing effort made, uh, put in. And all that was happening. When this government, when they were in opposition, they said, you know, it's a white elephant, you know, it's terrible and all that. So I think people got carried away with that, no doubt. But at the same time, we must understand that these assets have to yield over a period of time. Mm -hmm. Shangri-La built a hotel in um, Hamantota. Today, unfortunately, it is only having 15% occupancy. But I don't see them rushing to sell it. Because they know Hambantota will do well, mm -hmm. they'll hold that hotel, three, four, five years time it will make money. Mm -hmm. During the war time, Hilton came and built the hotel, mm -hmm. the, uh, which is in Fort. Taj Samudra was built at that time, but today they are making money. But these are assets that you would build for a long period of time. So to treat a strategic port as being not 
providing you with a huge quantum of cash within two years of it being built is, I think, completely out of question. Well, what they'll say though as well is that under your government, there was, you know, Chinese loans went from something like, you know, 300 million to 4 billion. That's okay. But I'll tell you why. And they, they were coming due and there wasn't enough money coming in. There was absolutely in. no problem. That is a lie. And we have seen them lying through their teeth on many occasions. Politicians lie. <laughs> but the actual figures cannot lie. If you take the debt to GDP with all these Chinese loans, it was down to 71%. That's the bottom line. Whether you get a Chinese loan or you get a Japanese loan or you get an American loan, it doesn't matter. Actually, the American loans that we have with the treasury bills and treasury bonds as well as the international sovereigns bonds that we had issued at that time, those are pretty high too, the quantum. There are a lot of Americans who are investing in Sri Lanka. All your top uh, uh, funds were investing in Sri Lanka from the Black Rocks to the Aberdeens to the... Um, uh, JP Morgan's, all of them were investing. So we did have investments from others as well. Chinese investments were the visible investments because they brought in, they built a port or they built a kapow plant. The softer investments came from you, came from the West. And those monies are still with us, some part, but some part has flowed away. But overall, we had a mix and the total debt that Sri Lanka had, which is the fundamental point that you have to manage, was coming down gradually. But what they'll also say, to be fair, is yeah. that Chinese debt comes at a lot more uh, pricey equation than... Again? And, and I went through the financial statements and you look at the... I went back as far as 2006. And you do look at like, for instance, a loan from China versus a loan from Japan or Korea or Kuwait. Uh, and you know you have Chinese loans at two percent, with a 0.5 percent com commitment fee, and then a Japanese loan at 0 0.125. Do you know why a Japanese loan is at one point or sorry, zero point? Even one zero point zero. Yeah. Do you know why that is? <laughs> why? I'll tell you. Tell me. When Japanese loans are in yen, mm -hmm. and you find that the Sri Lankan rupee is depreciating against the yen, mm -hmm. you will find that that hit is a lot greater than the interest hit. I've done my math and I can tell you, you may do that yourself if you have the figures. If you take the Japanese loans at the point that we have taken, the amount of money that we it yields and at the time of payment, the amount of money that you have to pay back out of your total amounts that you have to appropriate out of your, uh, out of your total uh, budget is enormous. But so this is the normal fallacy, I won't tell you. A lot of people think of it, okay, looking at the rate itself is enough. Do you know that Hilton Hotel, which I told you about, still hasn't been able to pay a dividend? And why? Because they have a yen loan. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, not a question of the interest rate only. It's a question of the totality of the circumstances, which many people do not uh, understand and appreciate. But those of us who have been looking at it from the point of view of overall conditions, you find that it is completely different. You know, the monetary board, even today, has to sign off on every loan, every foreign loan. So they, there is a department which does the math on this. And then you find that certain loans which appear to be extremely great are not so. They will have insurance uh, payments up front, which sucks the money out. They will have the problems arising from the uh, depreciation of the currency and the possible parity rates that will occur. There will be other strings attached like you have to buy certain items from that particular country only, which means that you will have to pay a much higher rate for those items than if you buy it otherwise. That's fair. That's a fair point. But the, China, but the Chinese... Uh, uh, the uh, the Thank you. What do you want? I don't know why I always have a hard time with that one. Um, it, it, it did appreciate actually quite a bit during the financial crisis. It did. It has come down since, but it did appreciate. And sometimes the loans were often in dollars. Um, yeah, loans in dollars will be better. From the Chinese. From and the Chinese. you could say that 
when the loans were in dollars and you look at what the U.S. was giving you, for instance, if you want to compare apples to apples, dollar loans, the U.S. would still give you more favorable interest rates. I'll tell you, you see, this is less what again another fallacy. Because, because you find that there are, that there are several uh, indicators that you look on a macro scale, Maria. Mm -hmm. One, which is your total debt servicing for the year. In 2014, it had come down to 4.4%. It's there in, in the Central Bank's annual report. Now it has gone up to nearly 5.8%. Mm -hmm. So if they were able to uh, do something different, it should have come down. What is happening? Again, another thing that happened was that Sri Lanka was not a poor country after it passed about $1,500 per capita income. Nobody is going to give us concessional loans. We had to borrow at a high rate. And if we could have e opted for a 3% growth, and not borrowed and just go on telling our people to stay poor for 40 years, which is an option. Or you can borrow. You can say, okay, we will have accelerated development and then we'll do so, which is what we did. And whilst doing so, we also made sure that our numbers stayed uh, benign. Because if you look at the total uh, debt servicing, just 4.4%. It has now gone up to, I have the figures, I, we did some... Uh, debt servicing, was that when you left, or...? Debt servicing, it's 2014. Mm -hmm. 2014. Was, uh, what percent? Actually, not 4.4%, it was 4.2%. Mm -hmm. Total debt servicing, Chinese loans, American loans, uh, British loans, Japanese loans, all that put together, it was 4.2%. 4, 4 Went up to now 5.5%. Mm -hmm. It had been rising steadily. So, overall, they have been borrowing at uh, rates which have been high as well because of the fact that due to other reasons. For example, if you have high in, uh, inflation, you'll, your interest rates will go up. So, if you don't manage the rest of it, that impact is a lot worse than the other one. That's my point. So, do you worry though about Chinese debt trap? No. You don't? Why not? But, because I don't consider debt as being Chinese debt, Indian debt, British debt, American debt and so on. I treat debt as debt. When you put all the debt into one basket, it doesn't matter which debt. I think the Americans are always uh, quite... Uh, uh, they have a phobia about Chinese debt. Because they feel Chinese debt is going to upset anybody. It's not Chinese debt. You can go down that same way with any any other country's debt. Now, if you take the if you take the uh, sovereign bonds that we uh, that we floated, I have here the sovereign bonds. The last sovereign bond that we floated at the time that we were in office was um, okay. Was a billion dollars at uh, from was a billion dollars at six percent and another five hundred million dollars at five point one percent. One billion uh, at six percent mm -hmm. and five hundred million at five point one percent. This government has increased that. In two thousand fifteen, they borrowed at six point eight five. Two thousand sorry. Two thousand and fifteen, mm -hmm. they borrowed at six point eight five. Mm -hmm. 2016, they borrowed at 6.85. 2017, they borrowed at 6.2%. Mm -hmm. So, someone can turn around and say, look, uh, the American debt has gone up. Well, well but, the, but you're talking about well, bonds, though, are different. Bonds are different than saying, ah, oh, you're that's my great where friend. To. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. China, you're my great friend. Like, friends are supposed to scratch each other's backs, right? Like, I mean, for Why instance, can't we scratch the Americans' back? I mean, the Americans... That's what I don't agree. You see, what has happened is because the Americans when we pay the Americans, you, you don't a, mind into a into a, and I'm not saying that this is yeah. right or wrong, but the Americans got onto their high horse and they said human rights, human rights, human rights. China doesn't really 
have that consideration. So that's also something that maybe affected your ability to tap it. Not really. Right? No? Not really. No. The Americans invested too. They did, but not at the rates of the Chinese. And Certainly. the Americans will say, but we do give, we are the largest grant provider to Sri Lanka. We are the? The largest grant provider to Sri Lanka. Come on, that's not going to happen. But I mean, you also look at, you look at the, fin the Ministry of Finance reports from 2000, I think it was 2012. That's what the Americans like to think. But sure. those grants are a minuscule amount. It has absolutely no impact on the country's economy. I can tell you that. But China only gave 10 million in grants Doesn't matter. I in 2012 be... compared to 4 billion of loans. Why should Sri Lanka be on a grant? Are we beggars? I don't believe that. But if you have a friendship want... with the country, you give grants. Not necessarily. We don't need to go and ask for grants. I certainly, in my nine years, we never ever asked for anybody's grant. Mm. We said, if you want to invest, you invest. We'll respect you. That's it. You see, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think we, we need to now be uh, beholden to any country and say, you know, we'll uh, we want grants and all that, Maria. That that story is over. At least with the previous government. I don't know about this government, their policy. So because that shouldn't be a consideration. Okay, we'll get grants mm -hmm. for what? Are we going to be beholden to everybody forever? No. Do that you shouldn't happen. When you look at Hamantota and you look at LAFs, for instance, being squeezed out, a Sri Lankan company, a big Sri Lankan company, an important Sri Lankan company, being squeezed out of Hamantota, which should be welcoming Sri Lankan companies. And then you look at the issue with Blackstone and uh, Greenlink. Does that worry okay. you? Do you know LAF Gas mm. was a tiny little company in 2006? Was they sorry? They were a small company in 2006. If you do a little research, you'll probably find that. Mm -hmm. They grew during the period of 2006 to 2015. Sure. So actually during that period, many Sri Lankan companies were on the up. There were some which were billion dollar companies. Okay. If you take Mass, if you take Brandix, some of them were small companies. But they grew because they were also given support to grow. And that was a deliberate policy of government, just like the American government, Trump is saying every day, we give the support to the American companies. I don't see anything wrong in that. Giving support to your own indigenous companies is, a, is an important facet of policy. Sure. So that policy we followed. And there were many, I don't know the policy now, and whether they have not been able to do certain projects that they wanted to do. But I can tell you during that period, they were given su sufficient support to uh, move forward. S some of the big roads were built by Sri Lankan uh, companies. But you feel like, do you feel like this Hamantota deal is going to, I mean, have you been following the Greenlink Blackstone situation? No, not so. Okay, I would, I'll skip that question. Yeah, yeah. Um, one question I do have for you is that you yeah. know, Hamantota was started, it was supposed to be phase one, phase two, phase three. Phase one was supposed to create this port that had row row and bunkering, kind of a simple port, let's put it that way. And it was supposed to pay for phase two. And phase two was only supposed to be delivered, I think, next year or year after. But then it seems that Mr. Rajapaksa decided to speed up phase two. And the initial loan for phase one, which was for 307 million uh, given at, I think it was LIBOR plus 90 basis points. Do you remember? I can't remember the exact okay. point. That was then renegotiated to 6.3%. But these are all the stories that people say. I don't think those are correct. They would have been all taken as decisions on the strength of the necessity for the project as well. If you look at all the loans, there will be a rationale for it. And anyone can go through that because I know for a fact that all these all these loans cannot be taken by Rajapaksa by himself. That's what some people try to make it out to be. But these we have fairly strong procedures and processes in our country. Those will have to go through the Department of External Resources. There will be the Economic Research Department of the Central Bank, which has to sign off on those numbers, saying that they are satisfied that those are of. Uh, value. After all those factors are done, only a foreign loan can be obtained. Just because Rajapaksa feels like it or Anil Vikram Singh feels like it, it cannot be taken. There will be a process that will 
make sure that that is done. And at different times, there may have been different rates during because of the crisis in the world or due to the other factors in Sri Lanka which made us a bad risk at, that, at one time. We were, we were at war, we had difficulties. So it can be due to those risks. I don't know the details. If you take, give me access to the uh, documents that the Central Bank as well as the Ministry of Finance has, I could tell you. But offhand, I wouldn't believe anything that says 0.9 became 6%. I mean, that's kind of thing which is for purposes of the headlines. But you, you negotiated the 2010 financing for the phase two project, right? Not that. I negotiated all the bonds and I know that each bond is different to the other. That's why each bond will have different rates of interest. Now, after Sri Lanka has, has uh, turned the corner, we have got into a much better situation uh, than earlier. Mm -hmm. Why are we paying 6.8% for a loan? in the in for the international markets for the yeah, bonds. Yeah. Why? Because maybe the global pricing has changed. So if somebody looks at it alone, I will say it is high. But I cannot tell you that it is due to any other reason mm -hmm. unless I go into it because there will be factors that I'll have to consider and then see. That is where a lot of people jump the gun, Maria. They just say, okay, now it was so much, now it is so much. I don't think that is the right way of looking at it. You have to go through it and see. And the final impact is on your bottom line. Sure. As the country is concerned, how much is it in your investment? Uh, uh, how much is it going to cost? And are we going to get more yeah, out of that? Yeah, that's the important part. Important part. Are we but going to get more? But you didn't negotiate any of the loans with the Chinese then so on how they took them? That was done by the Treasury. But I know they did it professionally. They were very uh, cautious about how they... Because there were a lot of loans that we turned down, not only from China. Wait, but the Treasury of the Central Bank? The Treasury is the one that negotiates the loan, but the Central Bank has to sign off before a foreign loan is taken. So there also will be another check and balance that is there. But that's the Treasury within the Central Bank, not the Finance Ministry, no, correct? No, Treasury as in the External Resources Department in the, in the Finance Ministry, uh -huh. which does the initial negotiations. Uh -huh. But even they cannot take a loan by themselves because it will have to be okayed by the Monetary Board, which relies on the uh, economic research department which again evaluates all these loans from the point of view of the country its repayment ability and so on so it's a process uh, it shouldn't be considered by these uh, headlines that politicians generally uh, dish out which can be for different reasons these are hard nosed technical professional decisions sure but there are two things one is that you said that Hamantota you know First of all, within the government's own feasibility projects, Hamantota was not was economically unviable. No, it was viable. I saw on the Sri Lankan Ports Authority website it says that, it, that from the two thousand, I think there was a press release from two thousand eight. Either way, under your government, two thousand eight, two thousand nine, under your government, it said several economic feasibility studies came through and said that this was unviable. I also, but it was done by presidential decree, correct? No, it's not like that. But was Hamantoto under if, presidential if decree? There may, president has to sign off, but there will definitely be discussion about that. Mm -hmm. And if you find that the first project report does not show a feasible situation, then what would you do? The second one? You will change it. You will see how best can we make it viable. That is the way business operates. I have been 32 years in the private sector, Maria. Sure. In so many companies. I know sometimes you have to tweak projects, you have to tweak the, the, the scenario in order to see that you can get a better deal overall. Mm -hmm. So if initially you find that uh, it has not uh, shown viable results, that doesn't mean that you abandon the project forever. I mean, it could have been many projects which would have started off as not being viable but people would have put their heads together, worked out ways to make it better. Yeah, and that's the way it works. So I think um, we shouldn't read too much in it. Why would the Chinese pay today the total cost that they lent to get 60% of the project? Why would they do that? What would they do? Why? Because it has value. What was that? Because it has value. Well, they said 
it only has value if you give us 15,000 acres around it. So they but, as, but as, I mean, it seems that they also thought that the port was So that 15,000 acres was there for the government too? Yeah, but it wasn't included in phase one, phase two, phase three. Yeah. You see, it, under, under your government, the way under our government, the port, we had it no wasn't 15,000 intention of giving it to the Chinese. But it also, but it also wasn't part of the development plan for, for Hemant Hotel. Why not? But I'm saying that the original, the, under your, your government, the original If this Hemant government Hemant could have added 15,000, you think our government couldn't have? But it wasn't part of the plan is what I'm asking. Yeah, what I'm government. saying is plans can change. Sure. Plans but, can change. Plans can be differently managed. So all that can happen, Maria. So, but the thing that I'm kind of confused about, though, is that if phase one, so if the government then said, okay, our new plan in order to make this a feasible project is to make it, so, pay, so phase one is a simple port bunkering row row. That pays for phase two, which we think could be delivered in 2020, right? And then Mr. Rajapaksa decides, no, I want to expedite phase two. You see, we never and said... ten years earlier. We never said that it's going to be unviable. We were always going to make it viable. Yes, but that was And the we plan. would have. But did we ever, plan. did you ever hear anyone saying in government that we cannot pay the loan? No, but why did you decide to expedite phase two? So why not? I don't why not? Because What's at problem? that point, phase one hadn't even been operational to pay off yes. for phase two. So if we get it going and we have a bigger scale sure. and we are going to market it, and then do it, and then put Sri Lanka on the map fast. What's the problem? Because then you get to a point where you can't pay off. For you your could loans. pay off. That's why I've been telling you from the beginning. You've had seventy-one percent. But but you had loans coming due. You had maturity. We coming. would have. That is the story that these people are selling, mm -hmm. and you don't buy that story. Okay. Because that's why I'm here to talk. Yeah, to you. That, I'm <laughs> glad you are talking to me. Don't buy that story. Sri Lanka was never in trouble. Okay. Never in trouble. You go through and show me one macroeconomic indicator that appeared to be on the wrong side, then I will tell you that uh, I, I'll, I'll withdraw my comment. Mm -hmm. But there wasn't. It was in great shape. It had all the macro fundamentals moving in the right direction. We were confident of that. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to even develop it faster. You see, what sometimes you from the West do not realize that we have to also deliver these developments to our people fast. You try and tell a person who is in poverty that you will take him out of poverty in 15 years time. You think that will sell? You think that's what we need to tell? We didn't follow that. We said we want to have fast growth. We want to put Sri Lanka on the map and take it forward. Mm -hmm. That is one of the reasons why today you see the popularity of Mr. Rajpaksa. I can tell you that. Because people said Sri Lanka was like a huge factory. Things were happening. Mm -hmm. Things were moving. There was economic development. And one of the ways it, it would have been done is we would have accelerated projects, we would have doubled projects, we would have seen that it became big. We had a vision. We had a drive. Mm -hmm. We were not fighting with each other to see that we pull one part of the government down with the other. That is where the difference was. And we were, actually we were in a hurry. And that is to see that the people of this country are given the benefits of uh, economic development. Mm -hmm. That is why you will probably find that the popularity is now even soaring. That's why I am confidently telling you. Because people want that to happen. People are saying, you know, we can't do this anymore. Yeah. So, I'm glad that you asked me the question. We doubled certain things, we went fast. Do you know they haven't been still able to add a single megawatt into the grid? Proper megawatt? Other than the uh, housing uh, solar panels that we are all fixing? Mm -hmm. Why do you think this government was so quick to negotiate this Hamantota deal and lose such a great port or such a great asset? Two things. One is their incompetence. Mm -hmm. They do not have the ability to think far, to think of the bigger picture and get things done. Two, they were in a hurry to destroy the Rajapaksa name. They even went to the extent of storing Paddy at the airport uh, lounge. In Hamantota. That is, they were in a huge hurry to discredit. Mm -hmm. 
and to say all these projects are of no value, it has no meaning, it, has, it was bad, it was corrupt and so on. That is why they actually failed because they did not want to build on the projects that uh, the Rajpaksa government had started. They gave the wrong signals, they attacked the businessmen, some of them ran away. James Packer ran from Sri Lanka. He was one of the biggest uh, investors who was going to do a $400 million project. So like that, this government uh, took some decisions, uh, Maria, which hurt them. Actually, they thought they were hurting the Rajapaksas, but actually they hurt themselves. Mm -hmm. And they found that the investment dried up. Mm -hmm. They found that no one else was coming. You know, I have had lots of the investors who come to Sri Lanka, they talk to me as well. And they, they say, why did this government stop this Chinese investment? Why did they stop the port city? Because they, being American investors, they like to see projects of that nature. Because then they, they knew then only their money is also going to give them returns. Because they want to see these projects, the real economy doing well. Because what we are doing is the financial side of it by funding and all that. But real economy, the ports, the roads, the airports, the power plants, all that must also grow. So that was what was uh, happening and which this government couldn't get the act together to do. I'm going to leave you. Thank you. This was very useful. It's always important to get the other side of the story. Yeah, absolutely. And I hope Happy that, to do so to you. that this will not be the last time that we meet. I hope that you I call me back. and then uh, if I'm free, I certainly would like to uh, have a chat with you, give you that side of the story. I've been uh, happy to do that uh, with the whoever who comes. And, uh,